Okay, so final, final talk today is, is Ashley Patience. Um, we met last night in, randomly in a taxi um, going to the hotel and had a good chat about, um, about children in schools and how the people part of this may work. So it was a sort of fortuitous meeting, but it was a really good chat. So Ashley's going to... I've never seen someone with, I think, educator, researcher and farmer on their badge before, yeah. which is probably exactly what we need in this, this discussion. So I'll leave it to you for the Thank final you. words. I think I need to just, I had a lot of questions um, about, yeah, the, the badge and where it comes from. So I've been an educator my whole life, uh, high school biology, obviously. And then, um, thanks. And then, okay, I'll use that. Sorry, from a poor school without all this stuff. Um, and yeah, so, I'm a researcher, master's in uh, sustainable agriculture with uh, Dr. Khalid Sali, and he's unable to be here, so I'm uh, doing this talk on, on our behalf. And then lastly, uh, we have a mussel farm in Saldana Bay. And uh, so in practice, I know the, the struggles of the mussel farmer and of the aquaculture farmer. So a very interesting um, cross-section um, I occupy. So the talk is uh, going to come down from uh, the technical and just um, and be more um, general in its approach. And as you can see with the introduction, just uh, looking at how aquaculture, um, research, development, and innovation can help us to cross uh, numerous divides uh, that we have between um, success and, and failure or struggle, um, and how that can lead to substantial delivery um, for the people who, who need it the most. I just thought that any aquaculture is worth his salt. It's got to have that graph uh, in it. So it's been spoken about before. And we can just see that in South Africa, even though our uh, capture fisheries is uh, 6 billion plus industry, it's obviously flattened out. And we're not going to get more um, out of capture fisheries. In fact, we're probably just going to get less um, as the oceans continue to deteriorate. Um, and as you can see, aquaculture is picking up the slack and it's going to provide us uh, with the food that we need to feed uh, increasing populations. In Africa also, just to put it um, basically into perspective, I think some of the numbers are a little bit dated, um, 2016, but Africa that has got so much potential only makes up about 1% of the global aquaculture production. And so um, as in South Africa, um, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, we're obviously all working furiously um, at looking at the short uh, falls in uh, seed, feed, uh, knowledge capacity, and, and finance, which I'll speak about later, sorry. Um, just, yeah, I think that's obvious, the socioeconomic value of education, we'll come back to that, sorry, of, of aquaculture. Um, in South Africa, just a brief overview, just to, if anyone here is not familiar that um, we have quite a couple of species uh, that we're cultivating, but our big success story is the abalone. And um, 18 farms, probably more than that now. Um, and there's a great um, opportunity for, uh, as Grant mentioned earlier, um, for expansion in each of these um, areas, especially seaweed. Uh, John Bolton spoke recently at ASA about um, what the West, the West is calling, sorry, the seaweed um, revolution. Um, but really, he says the East has already been farming um, extensively in, in seaweed, and, and we should get on uh, to doing that ourselves. Um, just there, um, a large income for the country, and uh, one of our success stories. I needed to put that in because that's uh, the product that we're farming uh, in the bay. It's not without its uh, issues. The pictures in front are just the rafts, the black muscle rafts, and, and our farms are long line uh, farming, um, which um, is further out uh, in Big Bay and in North Bay. Um, fresh water, that's the success story, but um, as we'll see in a moment, um, obviously environmental conditions in South Africa doesn't always make um, trout farming viable uh, throughout the year. And so uh, good, I think we had some last night in the starters, if I remember correctly, there's some um, trout, so a clear indication that's one of our 
um, success stories in, in the industry. Uh, developing sectors, and this is obviously where I want to focus more on because uh, we need to create jobs, we need to um, create food security, and we need a common man, uh, wherever they find themselves, to, to come into aquaculture and to be able to make a living because um, I have a slide just a little bit after this where I really think that we sit in a ticking time bomb uh, when we look at the triple threat uh, of unemployment, um, inequality, that, that threatens um, our democracy, that threatens uh, people's lives. Um, so I'll speak a bit more about that, but uh, tilapia is definitely the species um, that we're looking at for, for further production, further expansion. And there are a couple of new marine species which I won't um, speak more about. Um, that's the slide I was referring to, um, and we were just, Grant and I were chatting yesterday and just saying that um, it's often, you know, when you look at it, then you can just say, oh yeah, okay, triple threat, inequality, unemployment, poverty. Um, but it really is a major threat. Um, and I think we've seen it rearing its head in our country when I put myself in the place um, of a man who has to um, support his family or woman, um, sorry. And um, if you find yourself in a situation where you're not earning an income and you're unemployed, uh, a desperation will creep in. Um, and so we need to be very mindful of that. Okay? And we don't want um, our population to suffer that fate and have to decide uh, what they're going to do uh, to feed their family. <clears throat> uh, so some of the barriers that uh, we always speak about at uh, Aquaculture Stellenbosch, and I'm sure everywhere, uh, this one has been mentioned that um, one of the main divides or barriers that um, affects our industry is low fish consumption. Uh, we just eat almost half the fish per capita that people eat uh, on average in the world. And so maybe there's a need for further um, campaigns uh, that push um, fish production. And I think that'll come as um, meat production becomes more environmentally um, problematic and also as it um, increases in price because of that probably. Uh, we have a temperate climate, which is fantastic. We've got four seasons and it's great, but uh, the fish don't think so. The warm water fish find it too cold in winter. The uh, cold water fish find it hot in summer. Um, and then we have limited fresh water resources, a uh, few sheltered coastal sites, uh, like Saldana Bay is, is one of them, but mostly our coast is quite energetic. Um, we all know about ESCOM. Uh, we showed Grant uh, ESCOM a push in the car yesterday and even told him what it meant and no told him not to repeat uh, to South Africans. Um, uh, yes, and so I just want to look at each of those very quickly. Uh, we all know that we're um, a freshwater shortage cunt uh, country. We um, have probably lower rainfall than um, half maybe of the world average. And um, so an obvious um, solution to that would be uh, to utilize the sea. Um, and fortunately, there's, so those are just um, land-based uh, ponds where that paper, they were growing algae, uh, pumping the water in from the ocean. And fortunately, we have um, the Taupe Marine Tilapia uh, project is uh, forwarding that, um, sorry, promoting that and, and, and have a proposal into the Eastern Cape government where those uh, white circles are just tanks in which they'll be growing uh, tilapia sequentially. And they've got some massive uh, tonnages um, that they're earmarking 100,000 tons by 2031. And um, listening to the, the input at the ASA conference again, it's definitely uh, backed by a lot of passion, a lot of research. And I think that that's the way to go. And so, um, um, sorry, Mozambique tilapia is able to grow um, perfectly in, in, in seawater. Sure. And um, those are just, he was saying uh, quite um, firmly that if you can beat the chicken, then you know you've got it made. And so he showed clearly with his calculations that it will cost almost half um, to grow a kilogram of uh, Mozambique tilapia in seawater than it would to grow a similar amount of flesh. Um, of chickens, so I think. Um, what I also liked about it, um, 
is that the vertical integration of their project, where they brought in a whole lot of industries and where people could get involved in, in, in a number of different um, um, opportunities to, to be part of this growth. Um, and just to take that back home, I live in, um, in the Overberg, and I always think of the river, the local um, Rafis on the Ent River. And we have not a lot, but we have a fair number of, of large um, rivers. And yes, they polluted, but this is where the CSR and other um, scientific research bodies come in. How do we treat the water that we take from these bodies and then grow fish in a multi-trophic way? And again, just including local communities uh, in perhaps uh, earthworm uh, snail farming and making on-farm feeds and so on. Um, but just the idea of sorry, of bringing people together. I just wanted to show that this actually happens as well. Uh, Dr. Sally brought a um, researcher from South America to do a fish leather workshop where they convert fish um, skin into leather. And those are the aunties there in Grayton prepared in the fish skin. And there's Dr. Sally doing some work. And uh, that's an actual product um, from one of those workshops. Okay, and then just... I have to cut it short, but very quickly, we have a problem with uh, temperature. So one of our projects is uh, we're going to be looking at uh, utilizing geothermal springs. Uh, we finished the pilot last year, where we went to Brunflay Correctional Facility and actually set up a, a recirculating aquaculture sent, um, system and grew some tilapia. And this year, we're hoping we have a proposal in to take it to a commercial level. And then also we have a problem with ESCOM, so we should be using solar, wind, and wave. And we are fantastically situated um, in South Africa to utilize those. And uh, the Hermanus project that they're busy with um, uh, utilizing wave energy is, again, just showing that it's actually happening. It's in the pipeline um, where they're converting wave energy into electrical energy. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's so much we could discuss, isn't there? There's, there's, we need longer. I think that's the key thing. Um, yeah, brilliant. So we're going to have a few. It is going to the coffee break now, I think. But we've. Um, you can leave if you need to leave, and we can stay here for a few minutes to um, to have a, have any questions. So um, yeah, I'm going to give these microphones out to the to the to the crowd, as it were. And if there's any questions we've got, Bernie, from the audience for any of the speakers or more generally about aquaculture in South Africa. Oh, that was loud. Can I ask? Where are we looking? Hi. Yes. Sorry, Esa pointed at me, so I thought I would go. Um, so I actually have a question, sort of um, for everyone, um, about uh, the whole One Health concept and people's approaches to food. My sister's an anthropologist and she works in people's relationship with food. And in South Africa, like if you ask a normal person, what's a really treat meal, they'll tell you KFC. And so you're gonna to struggle to convince me that fish is ever gonna take off, like have that kind of place in our hearts. Whereas in Norway, which is one of the sort of top countries in one of your slides, obviously they have this huge cultural history and relationship with fish that you can't like manufacture instantly. And I agree with you, like seafood is, you know, it should be going down because the ocean is overfished. And so I think aquaculture has this real opportunity, but I do think there's a sort of space in the One Health um, conversation to include almost like the humanities side of research and like have a sort of more, I don't know, like airy fairy as a, as a hardcore scientist, uh, have a speak about the sort of qualitative aspects of incorporating fish into like markets and stuff like that. Um, and then also, Esa, I wanted to ask uh, about your choice of of diseases, like why did you choose ones that don't occur in South Africa? Um, not like not as a critique. I'm just curious. I'm sure there was was logic behind that. Um, and then also for the OSIMS, how how do you maintain that as a free service? Like, are you funded by the government? And like, is that sustainable? Because if it's so beneficial, like if they didn't lose anything at all, like why aren't farmers paying for that? Because it seems really cool. Okay, great. Thanks. All right, so should I just quickly take that first point about the anthropology bit? Um, I think that it's absolutely right. I mean, habits are habits, right? We've got in the UK, we've got um, our top five things we eat are things we don't even produce ourselves, like even fish and chips, which is our, you know, that's our thing. Um, that cod comes from the north. It comes from Norway, Iceland, so on. So um, we, most of what we make, uh, including salmon, goes to other places. 
So that's just the world of you know food trade. I guess it, it's complex. The um, the the social sciences bit we, we talk about a lot about that in the in the One Health wheel. In that fact, those bits of the wheel were designed and and put there by social scientists and anthropologists rather than me pretending I know what that is. But I think it's just uh, that One Health approach just opens up the very conversation that you've just made there. And uh, cultural change is really important. It takes quite a lot of time. I mean, I, the comment I always make is that if, we go, if I go home to my own country, maybe it's the same here, most people in their, ho in their homes have got pictures, photographs, paintings of the sea with fishing boats in it. And we see it as a sort of, it warms our heart to get into the local harbour and see those boats. But very few people have a, you know, a painting of an aquaculture facility on their wall, right? We don't sing songs about, the, about aquaculture. We sing songs about fishing. And it's, it takes generations to change these things, but it is gonna happen. It is gonna happen because it has to happen. So I think some of it is time, really. And that's what leads to social change. But I'm a very big believer, we were discussing last night about children and about what they understand about the health of eating lean protein that's cold blooded and not using up much energy to be, make it. I think that's a very strong narrative that they, they will understand. Um, my kids already think they can't believe that we as adults are still having these conversations. Yeah. Did you want to say something, Ashley? Yeah. I just wanted to come in on, um, I think lifestyle, uh, the, the health issues um, associated with KFC, for example, um, I think that is maybe one of the big drivers that, that will push people um, in the direction of more healthy. If we can get it right, of course, you know, it doesn't mean that we have omega-3s in, in our fish um, because of the feed, you know, that's the, the most cost-effective feed maybe isn't rich in omega-3, so, so we also have to look at that from the aquaculture side. But I think that could be a big um, leverage point that, yeah, it tastes nice and good, but look at what's happening um, in disease issues. Yeah. Okay, so do we want to take the second point, SF, your, your, your comment about the, the choice? <laughs> no, I think, I think that's a really important question um, about why do we choose certain, certain diseases to work upon? And part of it was, in essence, uh, uh, CSR was approached by Arda Nebed to say that there is this problem of Tilby and ISKNV across the African continent and also globally. And there's no real or, or particularly on the African continent, diagnostic tools for these viruses are a challenge. And remember, CSR, part of our mandate is how do we improve capability of the state, but also assist our neighboring countries. You know, it's not just for South Africa. So that was part of the rationale that there is this problem of TOLV and ISKNV. How can we develop technologies to detect these diseases? But when we say we, there is no TOLV and ISKNV in South Africa, that's an assumption um, because nobody has done the surveillance because there aren't the tools available to do the surveillance. So now we have the tools and we can actually start monitoring. In fact, uh, we are working with the Department of Forestry and Fisheries there was a recent fish die-off in the case of, in KZN, and it's suspected that it could have been due to ISKNV or TLV. Now, if we didn't have the tools to do that, we won't be able to do the surveillance. So, uh, and and again, TLV and ISKNV is spreading across the world globally. It's moving down down Africa, and it's only a matter of time before we see it on our shores. If we hopefully. That will take some time, and hopefully we don't have it. We are able to would maintain our biosecurity and biosafety, but it is going to become a problem, uh, and you'd rather be proactive rather than waiting for the problem to be here. Okay, yeah. great, thank you. Maybe um, your lab needs to make a vaccine. <laughs> we, we, won't, we won't go there now, but that is yeah. a, good, a good moment for Tilby, maybe for the okay. future. Um, and the final point, I think, from the question was, how are you going to make your system free, or is it free? It is free. It is free. Yes. Uh, how are you to maintain it, I think? Is, so it's, it is government funded. Uh, the money comes from Department of um, Forestries, Fisheries and Environment and DSI. Uh, so we are basically building the system for them to be able to maintain themselves. So it is a government system that's going to keep yeah. them free. Great. Make the government pay for it. Yes, that's what we should do with all these things. Right. <laughs> it's our money after all. It's good. Um, yes, the lady over there. Thanks. Um, as the regulator, I saw you put restrictions 
regulatory restrictions as a problem, but where we are seated, we are trying to facilitate export of aquaculture products. And uh, we see that uh, maybe as the CSIR, how can you help in that area? Because the labs don't want to take risk uh, for veterinary drugs, registration thereof, or testing thereof that is lacking, that is affecting the market access as we speak now, especially to the EU. So uh, over and above animal health, have you looked at uh, how you can assist in that regard? Because for commercial labs, they'll be looking at that demand that is not there, who's going to send samples now and then, whereas the testing is mainly required for uh, market access compliance. Thank you. Okay, so I think the question was about who's taking care of those wider hazards that may stop trade from your South African sector to, say, the EU. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I, do you want to cover that one, Lisa? Um, I think I think from CSR and from our animal disease veterinary disease diagnostics point of view, um, we would be happy to engage and assist wherever we can in, in, in that regard with enabling market access. And that's the point of establishing an uh, OIE or our uh, reference lab at the CSIR for the agriculture industry is to enable trade and to work with government um, to reduce those barriers to trade and export. So I think I think we'd be happy to have a further conversation in, in that regard. Yeah, I'd also add as well, I think I mean, certainly in the UK that, that that's an issue for every country, right? That if they want to export something to somewhere else, they're going to have to hit those regulatory targets. And I think that we ended up in a place where it's a kind of public good, private good discussion between some of that stuff has to be owned by the government because no one else will do it and no one else can maintain that over time. So you may need to build, for instance, the reference laboratories that are able to measure those hazards that, are, that permit trade from your sector. But it may well be that new technologies and new things that are coming along um, could be provided by some part of the private sector um, doing some of that analysis. But that, that's the discussion about who, how important is it to own and to maintain this? Because if it's really important to maintain that, to make it occur, then it, again, it should be provided probably as a public good, like veterinary services are on behalf of the people by the government. A question over there in the, on the far side. Yeah, I have uh, three questions. The first question is, what is the government policy for developing um, marine aquaculture industry? And, uh, is there any uh, law uh, restrictions for developing marine aquaculture? And the second question is, how about the uh, attitude for the local people? Do they accept uh, for developing marine aquaculture? And uh, I know uh, in some advanced countries like Canada, uh, the local people, their choice is keep the environment and not develop uh, agriculture industry. So how, how about in South Africa? And the third question is, do you allow foreign companies to invest uh, in marine agriculture in South Africa? Okay, great. So, firstly, who owns marine aquaculture from a policy perspective? I think that's what you said. The policy. The, the policy. Who owns the policy? Secondly, what do the people think about it locally? And thirdly, can international investment occur? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, uh, it's not my area of expertise, but I'll, I'll, I'll give it a stab. I think, you know, in terms of uh, agriculture administration and policy, that's driven by government, and there is a strong um, if you look at the bioeconomy strategy and the blue economy, there is a strong push for to grow those areas and to grow those sectors for the benefit of South Africans uh, as well. And, and, and that serves two purposes. One is food, local food production and improved access to um, nutrition and, and, and protein and, and fish are a good source of protein or a alter good alternative to meat and chicken that may be more expensive. So from that aspect, there is um, definitely uh, strong policy and then the other is economics um, can we grow the sector for uh, economic benefits socio-economic benefits where we export and actually gain money you know and that can then be reinvested in the south african economy so i think that 
is clearly defined in the various policy legislation that is available in South Africa already. Um, and then maybe just to, to answer the third question, I think um, there is a appetite for foreign investment in various sectors across the country. And, and I think um, agriculture would be no different. So I think uh, government or South Africa would welcome foreign investment. Okay, in okay so we're just running out of time a little bit. So sure. on, the, on the second point, do the people want it? Ashley, do you want to make a comment about whether the people living locally to these facilities, uh, what do they think? Yes, there's definitely a demand, but the, uh, we have very strong environmental laws and so the environmental impact assessments uh, will determine uh, the rate of expansion, the possibility of expansion. Um, so it's again that uh, coming back to various, uh, that's part of our, uh, the thing holding us back in proceeding fast enough in aquaculture is that there are different government departments um, that sit and talk almost independently. And we've been talking for a number of years now of a single aquaculture government department uh, and we are still working on, on that. So, but yes, there's definitely an appetite among the government departments and among the local people. Great, okay, well, thank you very much. I think we have to call it a halt, otherwise people aren't gonna get a coffee break and then it'll be my fault. So, um, and I don't want that to happen. So thank you very much for staying. Um, there's lots more to discuss in this space. Thank you to the speakers. Really good chat, quite condensed, it was very good. Um, and there's one announcement that you will be sent an email apparently by the CSIR about the conference generally about your feedback. So make sure you tell them that this session was excellent. Okay, <laughs> thank you very much.